me just uh, preface this by, um, of my grand list of things to do in the 21st century, I, I never thought that fighting a dam that looks like something from the 1950s would, uh, would be on my uh, agenda, but uh, because of an, an, a secret process and an unfortunate series of events, here I stand before you doing just that. So we'll go ahead and uh, dive right in. Um, that's a beautiful shot of the White River from the bluff of Mountain State Park. And, hey, here is the proposed reservoir, and if you're familiar at all with Anderson, this is the 109 bypass. Um, the former Delco plants were down here, the Mounds Malls here, State Road 109, this is State Road 32, this is Chesterfield, this is I-69, this is the exit now 234, the State Road 32. Uh, State Road 67 interchange. This is the town of Daleville, and this is the Madison Delaware County line right here. So that gets get you oriented where this uh, uh, project is positioned. And most importantly, for a lot of conservation purposes, this is Mountain State Park right here. And this is you see the trails here. This is a city park. This is a range line preserve, which is a mountain bike park. So we've, and we've also got a park here in Chesterfield and a park up here in Daleville that would all be um, inundated or affected severely. So the position of the dam would be right here, and downtown Anderson is just off the slide right here. So this dam would literally tower over downtown Anderson. You can see it just looking up the river, so it's a, a pretty odd spectacle. And this is also the Anderson Airport, which would be pretty uh, s severely affected because they water would literally come right up to the runway there. So I don't know that FAA rules would permit it, so that might have to be uh, moved as well because the water is <coughs> too close to the runways. So how did this come about? Well, this is a post I actually wrote for Facebook, but it seems kind of appropriate for tonight. Um, uh, conceived as a self-professed nutty idea by the owner of a chain of convenience stores, Mounds Lake Reservoir was first proposed in 2010. It was vetted by a self-taught leadership academy and deemed to have no fatal flaws in the Phase One feasibility study by a consultant firm with a vested interest in performing the more lucrative Phase Two study. All these steps occurred out of the public view. It was hastily presented to the public when it was revealed by an internet news blog. Homeowners and businesses that would be inundated were given almost no warning of the plan prior to its public unveiling, in some cases one day. The reservoir to be developed by an unknown entity would destroy seven miles of free-flowing river, inundate several city parks and one-third of Mound State Park, resulting in the unprecedented destruction of a dedicated state nature preserve within Mound State Park. Here's some justifications. There were some early meetings last um, April, some early public, well, public meetings, except the public had no opportunity to speak at them, um, where they, uh, the consultant and the Anderson Corporation for Economic Development, which is the entity really pushing this proposal, um, gave a PowerPoint. And here are some of the justifications. Potential to enhance the environmental character of the region. <laughs> Enhance water quality versus current impaired stream status. The deep incised valley of the White River there makes it easy to build a dam because it's uh, it's pretty steep sided on both um, both on the sides. Relatively small impact to structures. Tell that to the 300 people who would lose their homes. And this was the real killer. They said they should build it now because environmental regulations are becoming increasingly strict. So, in other words, destroy it now before it becomes impossible to do it. Yeah. Enhance the environmental character. Here is what the river looks like right now in Anderson in the late summer. Flow is pretty clear, but it is an agricultural watershed, so there's plenty of nutrients from fertilizer runoff and livestock operations. This is what it would look like if you impounded it. This is uh, near 30th Street, and there's a, a small dam at around 16th Street that slows this section down, and all that nutri all those nutrient pool 
and you get all that algae and Eurasian water milfoil growth there as a result of the stagnation. And finally, the consultant included, concluded in the following, in the phase one, there is no fatal flaws in this, in this proposal that they could see to prevent it from moving forward. So let's take a closer look at this section of river. It's characterized by a relatively steep gradient. If you're used to the, the kind of flat gradient of much of the White River in Hamilton and Marion counties, this has a much steeper gradient. There's actually some series of what I'd call minor rapids or, or extreme riffles, one of the two. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and you can see there's lots of gravel bars. With uh, This is water willow, justicia, a common plant that uh, grows on gravel bars. And you can see the densely forested. And when, when you're looking at these pictures, Keep in mind that every tree visible along the river would be destroyed here. Oops. It's great for kayaking and fly fishing. And in fact, I'm speaking to a fly fisherman group uh, next week about it in, in Muncie, because obviously they don't want to fly fish in what we saw a couple slides ago, <coughs> algae and Eurasian water milfoil. The, there's a healthy riparian uh, margin with uh, plants like the water willow I showed a few slides ago. This is lizard's tail. Um, has little white flowers that droop over like the tail of the lizards, but forms this really healthy river bank. And you can see here the, the, how clear the water typically flows. Um, if there hasn't been a heavy rain event in July through October, the, the water flows very clear. In fact, that's what the bottom of, of most of this section looks like. It's mostly cobble and gravel. And you can see the mussel shells. Um, unfortunately, this section was severely polluted um, through a, much of the 20th century by industry in Muncie. But that, the Bureau of the Muncie Bureau of Water Quality did an outstanding job of cleaning that up in the 70s and 80s and 90s. And that industrial pollution is pretty much completely gone now. So it's it's the, mainly agricultural nutrients are, are the principal problem with the water quality now. But. Uh, the, uh, I'm always impressed when I'm kayaking in late summer because it just looks like some of these cobble <coughs> bottoms just look like a work of art. It's a great place to be on a summer day. Um, you can see the sycamores. It's a very intimate feeling because the, the trees are very close and the river is only about 50 feet wide and you just have the trees overhanging the river. It's just a, 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 one of the nicest places. I've kayaked to a lot of places in central Indiana and this is still remains, this is second, my second favorite stretch after Sugar Creek between Shades and Turkey Run. Wildlife is abundant in the corridor as you can imagine with all that uh, forested riparian area, pileated woodpeckers, map turtles, soft shell turtles, and your usual woodlands and, and water birds. As I mentioned, the valley is rather deeply incised and there's very high, steep bluffs, um, some ranging about 60 to 75 feet in elevation above the river. And this is the same spot, and you can see this kind of crooked beech tree in both slides. This is the same spot, my favorite spot to view the river from Mountain State Park on one of the high bluffs. It's just a beautiful river in all seasons. And the swift current keeps uh, water open, so it's always available for wildlife throughout the year. It's got an almost entirely undeveloped floodplain. There's very few buildings in the floodplain. So, so the floodplain actually functions as it should um, for flood storage. It, the river rises up over the floodplain and uh, then slowly recedes back into the bed. This is a, a picture from that same bluff of the river in a pretty high flood in January of 2013. And you can see, now imagine this huge flood here going over the spillway of this proposed dam just right by there by downtown Anderson, having that huge audible roar um, throughout the downtown Anderson. It's just kind of an eerie thought to, to, to envision that. And of course, Mound State Park and Mound Spend Nature Preserve. And this is the real, the 
course, we hate to see a free-flowing river ever destroyed, and and but um, the fact that they that, that people proposing this thought that they had the right to come and take a third of a state park and a state nature preserve from us for dubious reasons is just pretty uh, outlandish. This is the fen, by the way. The fens are pretty unique uh, wetlands in that they are they are uh, a product of various layers deposited by uh, glaciers and glacial outwash. So there's uh, sand and gravel deposits that carry all this water down and it hits an impermeable layer and then it emerges at the surface um, here. And they're often, you don't think of wetlands being on a slope, but often these, uh, and particularly this Bennett at Mounds Park, the upper part of it's pretty steeply sloped. So you're, you're uh, standing on a, on a very steep slope in saturated soil. Um, here is Mound State Park. Um, what we've got here, there's two dashed lines, and those were the two proposed reservoir levels from the Phase 1, 870 and 875 feet in elevation. And you can see, here's the Fen Nature Preserve. The Fen is entirely inundated. Um, here, these are all deep ravines that I'll show you in a little bit. They have spring-fed streams that never freeze or never dry up and they would all be destroyed as well. The floodplain, of course, would be entirely inundated throughout this section, and the road, the park road actually to the campground would be inundated too. So that would necessitate either abandoning this campground or building a new road which would further compromise the, the woodlands of the park. So this is Mountain Spend Nature Preserve. Um, the pink flowers you see are queen of the prairie, and that is a pretty much an obligate fen species. It only grows on fens. It's a Philopendula rubra. It's a, one of our most spectacular wildflowers. And here is the Nature Preserves Act, uh, section, section 15, and it states that nature preserves may not be taken for any other use except another public use after a finding by the commission of the existence of an imperative and unavoidable public necessity for the other public use and with approval of the governor. So those are the provisions by which you could actually take a state nature preserve as laid out by the Nature Preserves Act. <coughs> um, MPAW's past president, Tom Holman, who is here in the front row tonight, um, explained why this, uh, why this matter is imperative to the integrity of our state nature preserves. And I'll focus on these last few sentences. In addition to this damage, the reservoir would also undermine the state nature preserve law, which has not faced a challenge since its passage in 1995. State law provides that a state dedicated nature preserve may not be disposed of or used for other purposes unless there is determined to be an imperative and unavoidable public necessity. If economic development is determined to provide that necessity, then no nature preserve in the state is truly safe. And that's one of the reasons we're fighting this, because this is a horrible precedent. This compromises our whole system of nature preserves if this goes through. There's the Queen of the Prairie in full bloom on the fen. It's one of our most spectacular wildflowers. And it uh, blooms very heavily. They occasionally do prescribe fire on this fen to keep it open and to keep woody plants from invading. And after a prescribed fire, there will be just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these inflorescences. It stimulates it to bloom very heavily. Uh, prairie Indian plantain, this is another extremely conservative plant that only grows in high quality wet prairies and fens. And this fen also features a, another specialized, even more specialized habitat called the Marl Flat. And where the groundwater discharges the highest, you get this, this crumbly calcium substrate, which is known as Marl, and it's highly alkaline, and it's a very stressful growing environment. So the plants that grow there tend to only grow there. So we have uh, this tiny little orchid, the Shining Ladies Tresses, Spiranthes lucida, and Calms lobelia are two of the plants that grow on these, in this marl flat habitat. And here's a couple more, the Agalinus purpurea and the Grass of Parnassus. And these are actually greatly magnified pictures. Most of the marl flat flora is very small and very depauperate. 
So here's some of the state rare plants that grow on Mounds Bend Nature <coughs> Preserve, and these can all be found on the, in that marl flat habitat. The shining ladies' tresses, which you see in the picture, the tufted hair grass, and the meadow spike moss. And these are all, all uh, still there. And of course the sedge meadow in the fen harbors plants that are important for our declining pollinators. This fen is just a, a riot of color through the season. You saw the early summer photos with all the uh, Queen of the Prairie and uh, Indian planting, but later in the summer, uh, Joe pie weeds and goldenrods and asters um, really fill in. And this beautiful fen thistle, you don't think of thistles as being really conservative plants, but this plant only grows in high quality wetlands. And of course you have the, the more common swamp milkweed, but it also occurs there. Here's what the phase one says about the wetland impacts. And it talks about the inventory maps and that they'll, they're not terribly reliable, which we all know. And then it says, but it says down here, mitigation on some of these areas will most surely be required, but should not be an issue and would most likely follow the procedures and coordinations as any project of smaller size. So they, they think they can take this nature preserve this rare wetland and get a rubber stamp from the regulatory agencies to mitigate it. But uh, Lee Casebeer, who's also in the front row here, uh, has an upcoming article. He's the retired assistant director of DNR Division of Nature Preserves, and he explains the fallacy of mitigating a fen in the upcoming spring issue of the <coughs> Impaws Journal. As this reservoir drama unfolds, proposals will surface that natural resources lost through flooding will be mitigated by replacing them elsewhere through habitat restoration. One of the great fallacies of our day is the lie that recreating habitats through mitigation is somehow an equal and satisfactory substitute for destroying significant natural communities. In this case, how do you replace a landscape scale, glacially created, groundwater fed, complex system whose parts are not fully known or understood. It can't be done. How then can one begin to fairly mitigate and fairly compensate such a significant loss? So look for his article coming up in the Impaws Journal, and uh, that's a really profound and really great uh, observation. And um, at somebody who's worked in the natural area restoration business for 20 years, I would echo that. We do not know how to make this. Man does not make fens. Ice ages make fens. There's other types of wetlands. So a less specialized groundwater fed wetland are these uh, shaded seats. And right now the skunk cabbage is in bloom. I just photographed it yesterday as a matter of fact. Later in spring, marsh marigolds uh, bloom in these specialized habitats. The kind of technical name for them are <laughs> circumneutral seeps, and they tend to be dominated by skunk cabbage. There's the uh, skunk cabbage in foliage. And this is a uh, map of Mounds Park with all the groundwater fed areas highlighted. And you can see the main fen complex here with the nature preserve, but actually all these little dots are these circumneutral seeps, they're just abundant throughout the park. And there, there, there's a long stretch of them along the river up here, stretch up here by the campground, way back in the ravines. And like I mentioned, oftentimes they're on hillsides. So you'll be walking on a hillside and then all of a sudden the footing gets horrible and it, this, the soil is just greasy wet. Other wetlands would be lost. Um, this is also within Mound Spend Nature Preserve. This is a uh, ephemeral wetland that uh, is outstanding um, amphibian breeding habitat. And it dries up in July and August, but is, is usually filled with water throughout the winter and spring. And this is on the range line preserve. And that, that's a property, I'll describe it a bit to you. It's a series of old gravel pits is what makes up the majority of the land. However, the area, the riparian corridor was never mined or disturbed, and it's actually got some very high quality riparian corridor, and the river through that section is absolutely beautiful. It's absolutely 
wonderful cobble bottom, and there's a, it's just a real riffly section. Um, that earlier section where I showed the mini rapids was from the range line uh, section. But uh, this is actually an old part of the gravel pit that had grown up in trees, but it was like an old drainage feature or something. But then the beavers came in, dammed it, the trees drowned, and all this neat wetland vegetation came in from the river. Lizard's tail, water willow, swamp dock, and now it's, it's a pretty neat, high-quality wetland. And there's other numerous depressional wetlands on that property. Here's some of these uh, streams in the deep ravines in Mountain State Park that, um, as you can see here, cold midwinter, but they never freeze and they never dry up because they're always spring-fed. And then in, in uh, here in another month or so, the Louisiana water thrushes, you always hear them singing here along these, along these beautiful little streams. And they're, we'll, we'll cover it more in the forest, but the loss of, of forest habitat for, for birds like that, the Louisiana water thrush, is just stunning. State rare dragonflies occur on the, on the, in these wetlands. Um, this is the brown spike tail, Cordylogaster bilineata, and in, in the uh, James Curry's Dragonflies of Indiana, at least lists the habitat as seeps, fens, and small spring-fed streams. No wonder it's in the park, it's got all of those. And this one, this is a huge dragonfly, and it's still there, I saw one last summer, um, when I was running, it was perched on a rock right in the middle of the trail. It's big, so it's pretty obvious, but it's the gray petal tail, Tachopteryx thorii, and from the dragonflies of Indiana, it says, is a dragonfly of hardwood forest. It has become rare and local with the destruction of the forest. It is one of the rarest dragonflies in Indiana. Females oviposit in permanent hillside seeps. So another one dependent on those seep wetlands. There's a third one that I don't have a picture of. Um, and uh, it is um, Somatochlora tenebrosa, and I'm trying to remember what the common name is, and it is um, clamp-tailed emerald. It has bright green eyes, and that's why it's called the emerald. In fact, it's uh, amazing. I've had them fly right in front of me, and those brilliant iridescent green eyes are just striking. So, we've established that these dragonflies that require these wetland habitats are here. So what did the phase one say of the dragonflies? Of the state listed species, three dragonflies are documented near the project area. Because these species are mobile as adults, they would not likely be impacted. Good uh, science there, huh? Then it goes on to say the remaining state listed species are plant species, and a plant survey would need to be performed to confirm their presence. Ooh, a plant survey, more building opportunities. <laughs> anyway, well, I've got some news for him. As far as Mounds Park, uh, the survey is already done. It was co-authored by me, and they are still there. <laughs> so um, this is a Proceedings of Academy of Science. There's actually been two, out, two very thorough plant inventories done in the park. In the early 90s, Dr. Paul Rothrock with uh, Taylor University did a plant inventory. But then they added some about 30 acres to the west end of the park, and they also did some stewardship in the fen, some prescribed fire, which brought some more species out of the seed bank. So I started noticing species that weren't in Rothrock's inventory and kept a list of them. And eventually, Dr. Rook at Ball State and Dr. Rothrock and the late Dr. Torkey, um, we went back into the, the park and uh, most of the field work was done in 2009 and documented well over 100 additional species bringing the total native species in the park to 478, which is extremely diverse for a 280-acre park. So we've got this, we've got these, and then we published those findings in the 2012 proceedings of the Indiana Academy of Science. And this highlighted part, Dr. Rook did a detailed uh, floristic quality survey, which I'll explain in the next slide. Um, the floristic quality <coughs> index is a way that botanists are able to quantify the quality of a plant community, and each species is assigned a coefficient of conservatism from 0 to 10, depending on their fidelity to a particular habitat. And I'll explain that. A weedy species like ragweed that will grow anywhere gets a 0, whereas those, uh, say, that spiranthes, that rare ladies' tresses orchid that will only grow in the marl flaps, gets a 10. 
So they average all the seed values, and then they, it takes into account the total species diversity, so that total of 478 native species, and spits out a numerical quantity. And for a floristic quality index, less than 20 has no importance of, as a natural area, so it's like a weedy field. Um, for, over 35 is profound importance, over 50 is paramount importance, Bounds scored a 96.2 for the native species, and even if you include the non-natives, it was still 87 point something. So it's an extreme, extremely diverse and clearly shows it's of paramount importance as a natural area. Um, and it's really comparable, um, he did a, a comparison to a lot of other sites. It's way higher than any other site in East Central Indiana, and one of the highest uh, inventoried in the southern two-thirds of the state. So, let's move on. Um, this is kind of overlaps with Mounds Park, and a lot of these pictures are taken in Mounds, but the, the effect on the forested corridor. Um, in East Central Indiana, we don't have a lot of large forested areas. We have woodlots, farm woodlots primarily. <coughs> this is an exception. This is a, actually a pretty nice forested corridor, and by far the largest in Madison or Delaware counties, and really the nicest forest corridor along White River north of Indianapolis. So this is what would be lost. The brown areas are forests that would be inundated by totaling over 900 acres of forest lost to this reservoir. Denizens of this forest, um, if you go to Mounds Park in a, here in about a month, every conceivable shade of hepatica will be in bloom on the bluffs. They're absolutely stunning, including these really deep blue ones that you don't see in very many places. Madison County's only known population of snow trilliums resides in this corridor. Shooting stars are abundant on the gravelly bluffs, and it's important to note that all those bluffs are not composed of bedrock. They're all gravel and sand outwash over glacial till, so they will erode terribly from wave action erosion. Little snowflake blossoms and miterwort, uh, metella. Um, here's some others, the Virginia spiderwort with its really showy flowers in early May, and then the showy orchis occurs in the wooded ravines at Mounds Park, a beautiful little orchid. Great trees would be lost. And here's a quote from John Muir, God has cared for these trees, saved them from drought, disease, avalanches, and a thousand straining, leveling tempests and floods, but he cannot save them from fools. <laughs> And uh, this is a giant Schumard oak on the floodplain of Mounds Park. <clears throat> and probably the best known grove of trees in the park is the Big Bur Oak Grove, right at the corner north, uh, or excuse me, at the south end of Mounds Fen Nature Preserve along Trail 5. These ancient bur oaks, I think, are probably around 300 years old. Um, they, they're so craggy and ancient, they, they appear to be uh, as old as the landscape itself. And a huge chinkapin oak that's uh, right along between Trail 5 and the river, um, just uh, near the nature preserve. There was a similar chinkapin oak that was cut just outside the park. Um, and I counted the rings when it was freshly cut. It was 315 years old. It's about the same size as this one. Tulip trees. Um, one of my favorite times to around Mounds Park is fall, obviously, uh, just the color, but what's neat, if you drive on Range Line Road and look across the fields at the bluffs, in late, in late um, October, typically, of course the fall color varies so much anymore from year to year, but you'll see these, the kind of the uh, green, it's, the oaks are usually still kind of green, maybe starting to turn a little bronzy, but you'll see these giant emergent golden crowns of the tulip trees towering above the oaks. And um, here's an example of one. It's growing deep in a ravine, a ravine that would be flooded by the reservoir. It's got about 70 feet of clear trunk, and its crown is up above the oaks and hickories on the uh, surrounding bluffs that are probably growing 30, 40 feet in elevation higher than it is. And this one is in an undisclosed location in the park <laughs> where I have... Uh, 
I found it many years ago, way high on a bluff. It, you, you can see just by looking at the bark how ancient that thing is. That is right just above the proposed lake elevation. So what would happen is the lake would come up. It's on a top crest of a steep bluff. The water would undercut it and right into the water. But um, I believe I'm not standing 20 feet behind that tree. I'm my hand is resting on the back of the trunk, so that is a truly magnificent tree. <clears throat> Outside of the park, this beautiful three-trunked sycamore with all three trunks three, between three and four feet in diameter is just upstream from Mounds Park, just not far from the Anderson Airport. I look like a little, little kid there. Of course, there's going to be a great loss of recreational opportunities, and for a lot of, I hate the loss of the natural area, but this is, this would alter my lifestyle beyond belief to, to build this, because it would take away where I cross-country ski, where I hike, where I trail run, where I botanize, where I kayak, would all be lost. And there are thousands of people, I believe, in, in Delaware and Muncie, in Delaware and Madison counties that would feel the same way. Um, this is uh, a bike race at the Rangeline Preserve, and here's the, the recreational parks that would be lost. Um, these are all the bike trails, and you can see with the, when the reservoir is built, what would be left would be the parking lot. <laughs> and this is that really high quality uh, riparian fringe along this property. Um, trail running is very popular at Mountain State Park, and I engage in it quite a bit. And that's me cross-country skiing just a few weeks ago. Um, it's great trails for that, big, wide, nice trails, nice terrain, just a beautiful setting. Um, the archaeological effects. Here we have a, a map put together at Ball State University. These are the Adena earthworks, the Dina Hopewell earthworks, and you can see some of them are as close to 50 feet to the proposed reservoir. Um, now, you, especially this little guy on the edge of the nature preserve, this whole little peninsula is just a big ridge of sand and gravel. That thing would disappear so quickly um, with the reservoir there. And uh, just 80 feet from the Fiddleback Mound, 113 feet from the Great Mound, and this circle mound is, pit, is perched very high up on the bluff, and this this is extraordinary. This is too steep to stand on, this bluff here. It is just crazy steep, and uh, it would definitely be neat, get eaten away very quickly. There's the Great Mound in winter, nearly a quarter mile around it. It's a, a huge earthwork, just an awesome, uh, awesome testament to the, to the uh, civilization that was there around 2,000 years ago. Here's what the Phase 1 study says. Oh, they give a nice um, accounting of the Adena and then later the Hopewell, blah, blah, blah. Largest earthwork, and they say that is unlikely to have any direct impact. However, anyway, um, it says obviously an archaeological survey will be needed in the next phase. But then it says something really strange. In the next phase, it will always also be imperative that outreach include the tribe's reference above as their official approval may be required. The only they reference are the Adena and the Hopewell. Um, good luck contacting them. Now, on a more serious note, there's a lot of friends of ours that uh, participate who would lose everything they've worked for their whole life. And um, several neighborhoods, or a couple of major neighborhoods, would be inundated. Here is the Mounds Mall. This is the historic community of Irondale. This is Hollywood Estates, which is primarily a mobile home uh, community. But this community of Irondale has been here for decades, 
and literally generations of families have lived here. I don't know how how you've been around Irondale. How many generations do some of those go back? Um, six six generations um, go back. So that's pretty amazing. And it's a working class neighborhood. It's not anything fancy, but it's uh, it's it's very important to these people. And they, they even have an Irondale reunion every year where people that grew up there come back to this neighborhood. And you can see this is one of our group members, um, obviously strongly opposed to the reservoir. But he has spent years remodeling his house. He's one of the multi-generational Irondale <coughs> residents. And he planned on living here his entire life and just worked uh, to, to make his house just the way he wanted it. And if you don't believe it's been here for a while, look at that old picture he provided. And his name's Brent Hagen, and he's uh, worked with our group a lot and uh, done, a, done a lot with us. But um, it's just a, a horrible to think that uh, something with this much family history would be lost. And um, as if there aren't enough problems, um, Mounds Mall has a dirty little secret underneath it. Um, back in the 50s, I think primarily about the 40s and 50s, um, 30s as well, the automotive industry was booming in Anderson. So we had all these suppliers for the automotive industry, and they had all this stuff they created that they didn't need anymore, including chemical waste and all sorts of uh, undesirable things. So they had this convenient place to come down the bluff and dump it all for a few bucks. So this was a, a pre-EPA dump that, um, that is full of a whole bunch of undocumented stuff. And we really don't know what's all in there, but um, it's uh, probably, we've had things like uh, metal plating operations and things that use pretty toxic chemicals that, that uh, dump things in here. And, yeah, there's lots of batteries, car batteries buried in here, because when they dig up sewers, they find them. So, no <coughs> fatal flaws. Who thinks that's reality after seeing this, or who finds that to be ironic? On November 13th, it was announced that the state would fund the Phase Two study. A $600,000 forgivable loan, how do you get one of those, um, was provided through the Indiana Revolving Loan Fund, a source normally used to provide loans for water and sewer projects. It was later finalized uh, about a month ago and raised to $650,000. Public water supply was the only rationale given since this fund can't be used for economic development. However, Citizens Energy Group, the largest water utility in central Indiana, was not even contacted for their thoughts on the viability of the project. And I will note that Citizens has been neutral through this whole thing. They are not a supporter. They are not advocating this project. They are not state. They are not publicly making any statements for or against it. But And it should be noted, for you, those of you not familiar with Anderson, Anderson's water comes out of wells, and these wells have plenty of capacity. <coughs> Anderson does not need this as a water supply. This is a statement from Governor Pence that was made with the announcement of the award for $600,000. The proposed Mounds Lake Reservoir would transfer, transform the Madison-Delaware County economy and help ensure ample water supply for central Indiana in the future. The Phase two evaluation will help us understand the possible impacts of this potential project, and I look forward to receiving the results of the study next spring, which is now next summer or fall or whenever it comes out. So, please, if you feel like the way we do after um, working around this project for nearly a year again, a year now, um, please write Governor Pence in defense of Mound State Park, Mounds Fen Nature Preserve, the free flowing river, and the affected property owners. And contact your state senator and representative and express your disapproval of the use of state money to fund a phase two study for such a project of such dubious merit. Please let them know that the inundation of one-third of Mounds State Park and the destruction of Mounds Fen Nature Preserve are not acceptable. 
and please write Governor Pence. This project, I feel, is a real permitting challenge. It is a defeatable project, but we need to make our voices heard. We need to be proactive, and we need to be aggressively proactive in combating this, this project. And this is just some uh, closing, uh, some examples, some closing words in a, in a letter to Governor Pence. Governor Pence, please do the, or first of all, say the rationale given for this proposal does not even come close to the level of imperative and unavoidable public necessity required by the Nature Pre Preserve Act for the destruction of Mounds Fen Nature Preserve. <coughs> Governor Pence, please do the right thing and kill this proposal by stating that you will not give permission to destroy this precious piece of Indiana's natural history or natural heritage. Please join our 2014 paddle protest. This is a great event. You get to see the entire stretch of river. Um, there's a, a wonderful canoe livery called Canoe Country in Daleville that um, gives you a boat for free. And, um, and you get to uh, paddle this beautiful stretch right to downtown Anderson, right below where the dam would be. And you get to see it, see it all. And um, last year we had about 30 people, or 30 boats, I think. This year, let's get over 100 boats. And finally, the Heart of the River Coalition. And there are business, you don't have to write these down, but these are our website and our, uh, our uh, social media things, but the, there are business cards back on the table that have all this information on it. So please, please keep to up, to up to date through our website and social media. And finally, we like to think that we've gone a long ways in the last hundred years on environmental issues, but a hundred years ago, John Muir said, these temple destroyers, devotees of ravaging commercialism, seem to have the perfect contempt for nature, and instead of lifting their eyes to the god of the mountains, lift them to the my, my, almighty dollar. And he had his reservoir fight over a hundred years ago, and here we are in the same boat. So that's all I have for you this evening, and I appreciate your support.